Well, Sunday night people, how many of you guys are actually registering a pulse tonight? All right, we got two, three, three, three. All right, the rest of you that are already sleeping, I'm going to tell a couple jokes to wake you up, okay? I love telling dad jokes, but only uh, half the time does he get them. That's great. Nothing. <laughs> All right, some of you guys didn't even get that one. Rock, what rock group has four men, but none of them sing? Mount Rushmore. Yeah, that's good. The online audience is roaring right now. I can hear them. I know a few jokes about retired people, but none of them work, so. <laughs> what do you call a guy with a rubber toe? Roberto. <laughs> that, these are getting worse. I'm going to do one more and then I'm going to quit. <laughs> Carissa probably read my sermon and was like, oh, these are horrible. You just let me, just led me to the slaughterhouse, Carissa. Thank you. I'll leave you this one. What do you call a pudgy psychic? A fortune teller. <laughs> That's bad. How many are registering a pulse now? All right, thank you. I'm glad that you guys are here. And uh, none of those jokes have anything to do with my sermon, uh, but every once in a while during the week, I like to look up jokes because I'm not very funny by myself. And I figured, you know what? The Sunday night crowd could use some jokes. And so I, uh, I was going to go with blonde jokes, but then I decided that I might offend someone, so I ended up with dad jokes instead. Um, we are starting a two-week series titled, Things We Wish Jesus Never Said. Now, back in January, uh, you probably remember the sermon series in the PM that uh, was things that Jesus never said, and such as like, God will never give you more than you can handle, or different things like that. But we are going to take just the next two weeks and talk about a few things that maybe we wish Jesus never said. And if you're to be completely honest, you might uh, find yourself thinking, man, it would be easier or I wish that Jesus didn't tell me that in order for me to be forgiven in heaven that I'd have to forgive those here on earth. Or maybe love your enemies or turn the other cheek or take up your cross and die daily. The list could go on and on about things that are uncomfortable that Jesus said that maybe if we're being honest and we take an evaluation tonight that we wish maybe he didn't say. This topic merits more than just two weeks um, but tonight I'm going to talk about something that will not be new to anyone here. Uh, turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 28. Pastor Jeff referred to this this morning, and I'm going to ask you to stand, um, and we're going to read this together out loud. We're going to be looking at verses 19 and 20. Some of you probably don't even need to turn there. You've got it memorized, but in case you don't, you can follow along with me on the screens. Let's read together. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now these are Jesus' words and uh, you can find your seats. You might be asking yourself tonight, um, how does this fit under the sermon topic of things we wish Jesus never said? I've got no issues with the Great Commission, to which I ask, when was the last time that you went? When was the last time that you made? I think it's very easy to live off of yesterday and even yesteryear's successes, but God isn't concerned with what you did for him last week or last month or last year. God is concerned with what you are doing for him in the very now. I didn't know because I didn't read chapter 10 before Pastor Jeff preached this morning. And uh, Thursday or Friday afternoon, we kind of were talking about sermons 
and uh, we all of a sudden realize, man, we might be stepping on each other's toes in these sermons. You know, if you, you missed this morning, Pastor Jeff, what an incredible, appropriate, missionary-minded, sending out message of going and making, because there's disciples, because there's people who don't know. And I really feel in my heart that this was the first passage that came to mind because we often live in such a manner that doesn't reflect Jesus' final words on earth. Go and make disciples. We tend to remind God and others of what we did last week. And I can just imagine God up in heaven saying, like, cool story, bro. I was there with you. Like, guess who gave you breath in your lungs when you were doing that? And guess who gave you energy when you were ministering and doing this and, and doing that? And here's what I would ask everyone to do. I want everyone here and everyone watching online to, to seriously take an evaluation of your heart and where you stand with actively fulfilling the great commission. We preach about this a lot. And the Sunday night crowd, I look out and almost every single one of you have impacted my life personally. I've got Sunday school teachers in the room and people that have poured into me and I've got people that are actively pouring into my family and my kids and, and spoken into my life. And, and I think it's easy as a tenured Sunday school teacher or uh, I've been in ministry and I've been serving for this long and, and it, it's, it's time for someone else to fill these shoes. I think it's easy for us just to, to check it off our list and say, I'm fulfilling the great commission, but I, I really want you to evaluate tonight and allow the spirit of God to reveal work that he yet has you to do in advance. That meaning, um, I said that very sloppily, the work that God wants you to do. And so let's just take a moment. I want to pray. And uh, I just want to invite God's, God's spirit into our hearts and into our minds. God, I pray that uh, tonight that you would speak to us, Jesus, that in such a simple passage that we have heard many of us dozens, if not 20 or 30 times preached on, that we would take an honest evaluation of where we stand with you in filling your commissioning of sending us out and making disciples. I pray that you would bring about an awareness of individuals in our lives that are ready for harvest, ready for discipleship, and we would find our role and we wouldn't balk at it. We wouldn't um, disqualify ourselves. We wouldn't run from it, but we would accept it with joy in our heart and gladness in our heart that we still get to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I love the song this morning uh, in the 8 and 9.30 that we sang, This Is My Testimony. And, and the, the bridge of that song says, If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. So tonight might feel a little bit more like a pep talk than a deep theological sermon, but I feel that this is important. So let's start with go. Jesus says, go into all the nations. Now, why is it difficult for us to go? And I think one, if not the biggest reason why we struggle with actually going is we inherit an authority issue. The first sin in the garden was what? Rebellion. Rebellion is going against authority. I have a six, a four, and a two-year-old, all of them here tonight, and all of them at different times in their life will question and challenge mom's authority and my authority. Why? Why do I have to do that? To which I say, because I brought you into this world and I can, no, I'm just teasing, I don't say that, but how many grew up with your mom who said that, right? Yeah, I, I, I grew up with a mom that said that. I never told my kids that. Um, but I do say that we are your parents and there is a level of authority and you need to respect your mom and your, your dad. I believe it's in our nature, but let's take a look at verse 18 in this chapter that so often gets skipped over. Jesus starts these words right before he speaks to the disciples and he says this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. 
When Jesus says and qualifies his statement that precedes this with saying, I've got all of authority in heaven and earth, meaning I've got all authority of over every single angel and angel army. I've got every authority over everything on earth. So now that you know that, go and make disciples. What that sounds like to me is that I don't have an option. I can't buck the system. I can't run from that authority. And, and, and Jesus is not you know, giving this as a suggestion. He is telling you his place of authority. And we either simply rebel against that or we don't understand that level of authority that Jesus has when he speaks. A good indication of your willingness to submit to God's authority is whether you regularly serve and habitually give. Now, some of you are saying, man, those are two external things, serving and giving. And I understand that there are people that can serve regularly and give habitually that still have an authority issue. Because it's very easy to do stuff here. It's very easy to give and send missionaries out and equip them to do the work. But maybe you still have an authority issue and God is asking you to go to a faraway land. God is asking you to give up something. And there's other areas of your life that you have an authority issue with. So I understand that regularly serving and habitually giving isn't just this giant blanket, but it is a good place to start. Other people, I believe, never go, and we struggle with this go because of financial reasons. But if God asks you to do something, is it reasonable to assume that whatever he asks you to do, he's going to equip you to do it? Would God ever call you into missions knowing your bank account isn't as high as you want it to be if he wasn't prepared to fulfill your bank account and get you overseas? I've uh, had the opportunity to lead several mission trips and every time I lead a mission trip, doesn't matter if it's a $1,200 trip or the most expensive I believe was $2,700 that we went to Africa. I've always had at least one person of the group come to me and say, oh, I just, I just don't know about the finances. I don't, I don't know about the si finances. And I say, do you feel like God is calling you to go on this trip? And they're like, yeah, I, I really feel like I'm supposed to go on this trip. I said, you don't need to worry about it. I have never had any of those people or anybody that is going out and stepping out in faith, going on a mission trip, not go because of finances, not once. In fact, usually those people that are most worried about it some unsaved relative writes a check for half the trip and it just blows their mind. And they're like, I don't even know how you can do it. I'm like, it's God. If God's gonna call you to it, he's gonna bring someone. It doesn't matter how it comes. God is going to, to provide the financial means for you to go. Psalm 50 says that God owns every animal in the forest and, and the cattle on a thousand hills. And you might be nearing retirement or retired and for whatever reason you don't have as many pennies saved up in the bank as you would like, but you feel a tug on your heart that you're supposed to go and serve. Let me remind you that your reward is in heaven is far greater than your treasure here on earth. I think one of the things that has freed me from financial worry and financial stress is when I realize that God's currency is different than our currency. The way that God's currency works is different than that. Meaning God might not always repay us through Benjamins and Jacksons. I believe wholeheartedly that my Chevrolet truck got healed by God. I, I know that's crazy, but if you believe Pastor Jeff's story of not mowing his gas, or not mowing his gas, <laughs> peace, peace, no, I'm seasoned, okay? Um, <laughs> I can't, I can't think. Gas in the, uh, <laughs> mowing, mowing his lawn with no gas. Come on, Lord, help me, okay? If you believe that, I believe that God healed my truck. I brought this truck brand new in 2012. Uh, I was living with my parents at the time. I had my first full-time job, and I was like, I want a pickup truck. So I went and bought it. Well, at 78,000 miles about three years ago, 
Um, I, I was having some issues. They were already doing some work. And I get a call from a technician while I'm down on Grand Avenue playing putt-putt with my family. And the technician says, your engine is bad. You're going to need a new engine. Over $5,000 of an engine. And I remember going to worship practice and uh, I remember I standing around the piano, and I believe Larry Hostetler was there, and, and uh, he may have even mentioned, like, hey, let's, let's pray for your truck. And so we just, we just prayed for it, and I just remember being so annoyed and frustrated and irritated. Well, I just am approaching 127,000 miles in about seven miles here, and it's the same engine, and it's... I don't know, it's like the Timex walks. You know, it just takes a licking and keeps on ticking, I guess. But I firmly believe that God healed my truck. He made it work. Now, is that because of a prayer? Is that because of, you know, financial stewardship on Elizabeth and I's part? I don't know, but I believe it all plays a part in that. And as soon as we can understand that God's currency is different than our currency and there will be blessings from God that might not just be in dollar signs, I think that frees us to be like away from the dollar where we're not so attached to it, where it's like, I don't care because God's got my back. Other people, I believe, don't go because they don't know where to go. Because Jesus tells us that we are to go to where? The ends of the earth, meaning pick a spot, any spot. We overcomplicate life. How many have stood around, probably in this foyer, and you're around a group of friends and you guys are going to go out to eat. And everybody's standing around, where do you want to go? I don't know. Where do you want to go? I don't know. Where do you want to go? Applebee's sounds good. Yes, yeah, sounds good. Oh, do you want to go there? I don't know. What do you want to do? And, and it's just like, pick it. Pick it. If you don't care, pick it. And hear me in life. If you don't feel a specific call to a specific region or a specific mission trip, and you don't feel like there's just something that like God is laying super heavy on your heart, stop overcomplicating it and just go. If food is food and you're just gonna go get food because that's what it is, what's the difference between a mission trip? Now, there are times that the Lord will tell you, I don't want you to go on that trip. I want you to go on this trip. Or I don't want you to be a part of this ministry. I want you to be a part of this ministry. Or I don't want you to be here or this. And we need to be res uh, responsive to God's spirit. But stop overcomplicating, am I called or am I not called? If you haven't been on a mission trip, you need to get your rear in a mission trip. It will change the way you look at life. It will change the way you spend your dollars. It will change the way you pray. I got to have uh, Carl and, and Sarah over to our house for about three hours this afternoon, just catching up, and their daughter was praying. Man, I'll tell you what, they are doing something so incredible, going somewhere where there are no Christians. He said, anytime you want to send a crew from New Hope over, we'll gladly welcome them. I'll tell you, you want to have your eyes opened, I'll get you Carl's number and you can go to, to um, Thailand and, and you can go have your eyes open. Stop overcomplicating it. If God's asking you to go, go somewhere and do something. Pick a spot, right? I challenge that no matter your age, that you make it a priority to go somewhere and share the gospel of Jesus Christ in 2021. The second command that is tough for us is to make disciples. And now before I ask a convicting question, let's define for just a second what it actually means and it looks like to make disciples based upon Jesus Christ's ministry here on earth. The first thing we see Jesus doing is teaching. Okay, Jesus knew the word and he imparted that word to his disciples and all those around him. And there were times that he was frustrated by their lack of knowledge. There were times that he was frustrated by the seemingly simple questions that they were asking. And you can almost sense the sarcasm in the text. Like, do you not understand? Do I have to put this in layman terms? Do I have to tell you a parable so that you can understand? But did he give up in teaching and imparting God's wisdom to those he was discipling? Not once. 
Jesus never stopped teaching. Not only did he teach by word, but he demonstrated his teachings by actions. Everything that Jesus has asked us to do, he has already done it. Do what I say, not as I do, doesn't fly in biblical discipleship. That's why holy living matters. And if you're in leadership, in a leadership role, you have a higher expectation placed on you, to which I say embrace it and be thankful for it. Embrace it and be thankful for it. We also saw that a part of discipleship and Jesus' ministry involved eating together. Now, some of you are thinking, what, eating together? Like, yes, eating is, is very much a part of discipleship. It's a sign of doing life together. If we reduce discipleship down to a one-hour meeting or a one-hour coffee a week with an individual and we forget that we just need to be with that individual and have community with them, we're missing a very important aspect and component, which is com- community. If we were to walk over to the student campus, you'd see in massive letters in front of the elevator that says, belong, believe, become. Now those weren't placed there just by accident and they weren't placed in a random order. But we truly believe and we see it in scripture that before you can become, Jesus brought in the sinner and made him belong. And then through the teaching he believed, which then eventually transformed an individual's life into becoming a disciple. Far before his disciples were true disciples, they belonged. And eating is a great way to do that. A third ingredient of discipleship is doing ministry together. Now, up until very recently, I was a college-age pastor, and one of the things that Elizabeth and I love and feel that we have a gift of, love doing and, and feel we have a gift, is hospitality. We love to have people over. And I remember this one time, Elizabeth inviting a girl over, and they were going to make dinner together. And Elizabeth would ask her for this or ask her to do that, and she had no idea what she was doing. She, like didn't know how to crack eggs. I mean, the whole nine yards just about like, I don't even know if she could make a grilled cheese, like didn't, didn't know what she was doing. And she began to tell Elizabeth, she's like, you know, I, I feel silly, you know, having to ask these questions and stuff. But when, when my mom, I would come and I'd try to help her, she would just get frustrated with me and she'd just say, I'm going to do it. It's just quicker and easier if I would do it. And she would send me out of the kitchen. So my whole life, I never baked and I never cooked because it was just easier for mom to always do that. You know what I'm thankful for? I'm thankful for Pastor Jeff and Pastor Weaver who have shared the pulpit with us younger guys so that we can learn and be discipled and have an opportunity to make mistakes. We can have an opportunity to grow in, in our speaking, in, in our study, in our, our habits. I'm thankful for that. And unless we give the people that we are discipling an opportunity to serve together, then how are they ever gonna walk on their own? It's like carrying a, a, a first child around, right? It's like you see these like 16, 17, 18 month old kids that still haven't walked. Well, why do you think they aren't walking? Because it's easier for mom just to pick them up and just go about her way and do whatever it is, right? But if we would just let the kid figure that out and have some falls, it's gonna turn into a running toddler and then they're really busy. Discipleship, a big component of it, is doing ministry together. We see Jesus doing this. Jesus gave his disciples things to do, and he brought Jesus, or Jesus brought his disciples into the middle of many of the miracles that he performed. He sent them out two by two. Did they make mistakes? You bet they did. Did they get it wrong sometimes? You bet they did. But in that moment, Jesus doesn't take back the recipe book and take back the ingredients and take back the cooking utensils and tell his disciples to go and wait until it's done. He uses that moment to teach, equip, and grow them. So I'll ask this question, and I want everyone here and watching online to really 
ask yourself this question, myself included, right? Maybe this message was for me. Because honestly, as pastors, we get people that are hungry coming to us. We, we get Christians. We deal with a lot of Christians. We deal with people that are, 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 are seeking it. But if we're not intentional about getting out and being exposed to unsaved people, it can be pretty easy to just kind of take the icing on the cake, you know, just cherry pick, if you will, in our discipleship. So I ask this question. Who are you actively discipling? Based upon the teaching, eating together, doing ministry together, who are you actively discipling? Can you even remember the last person that you really discipled, that you took under your, your wing and you showed them how to do it, but then you walked a lot alongside them and encouraged them as they did it? Who are you discipling? For some people in the room, the answer is sitting right beside you. Your kids are the one that you're called right now to be discipling. Others of you, it's gonna take a little bit more effort and forethought to find someone that you can disciple. I understand that this passage is a little bit weird to choose for this series title, but do your actions reflect a life that wishes Jesus never said, go and make? Because completely ignoring these painfully clear commands would suggest so. We're gonna end by taking the next three or four minutes to ask God, what is my role in the Great Commission? And it doesn't matter, you know, Austin, you're in seventh grade this year, bud? Sixth grade? It's your deep voice, I thought you were in seventh grade. You know, doesn't matter if it's Sam, my son who's in kindergarten, it doesn't matter if it's Pastor Kerry, doesn't matter if it's Big Ed. It doesn't matter who you are in this room. What is God asking you to do in regards to the Great Commission? Is he calling you to go somewhere new? Is he calling you to let go of something that you're doing that you've just been doing because God is moving you into a new season? Is God laying a name of a neighbor or a friend or a niece or a nephew or a son or a daughter, a coworker, God, would you begin to speak to our hearts? Would we not check out in this moment, but may we truly be convicted by your spirit to be true Christians, to be true disciples who make disciples. So speak to us right now, God.